All right, so thank you so much for being here. We, um, I come from a military family, so I'm very neurotic about staying on time. So we, I will have you out by noon. Um, but I will tell you two things. One, folks asked if they could live tweet, and they can. So that's um, our account if you want to tweet at us. If you are taking pictures or whatever it is you're doing, feel free. Um, so we're at, at draw the line on. Also, I'm going to ask folks to fill out a very quick, it literally takes like two minutes uh, questionnaire at the end. If you can do that, that would be great. And then we can provide feedback to the Algonquin folks about people's perceptions of what's going on. So the goal for me this morning is also we can't make it, it looks weird, but that's the only way it will not. So just run with it. Um, <laughs> every once in a while, if it like goes weird, um, it's because it's the best we could do. So um, yeah, so my goal this morning is to just sort of give you like a sort of a rough intro sort of conversation around bystander intervention and sexual violence. My work is specifically around sexual violence against women, um, so that's the focus of what I'm talking about, but we'll give you some stats on sort of the reality across Canada. Um, and it's just sort of a conversation to look at it in a practical sense, because I think what oftentimes happens is we talk about it on this like really high level thing of like, this is sexual violence and it's awful and it happens, but we don't actually talk about the tangibles of what to do other than call 911, which I will tell you the vast majority of people are not doing that. So let's hope this works. Yes. So first, I think what's really important is when I do this work, so I travel all across the country talking to folks about sexual violence and bias intervention, and that arrow is going to drive me nuts. There you go. Um, and oftentimes, one of the first things people ask me is, what is sexual assault in Canada? And I actually think that's the wrong place to start. I think where we should start is with the definition of what is consent. And if you're not adhering to this, then you know that you're in a, a bad space. So this is straight out of the Criminal Code of Canada, which I also think is important for folks to know, which is that on paper, not in practice, but on paper, Canada actually has a really chill, progressive understanding of consent. <coughs> so consent under the Criminal Code in Canada is the voluntary agreement of the complainant to engage in the sexual activity in question. So voluntary agreement is really important. So it talks about how coercion is not consent. So if you've made someone feel like they have no choice but to say yes to you, because if they don't, you're going to spread rumors about them, they're not going to have a job tomorrow, they're not going to get an A on their paper, then yeah, you might have eventually gotten a yes out of that person, but it wasn't a voluntary yes. And the law recognizes coercion is not consent. The second big thing that's important to get is that it's the engage in the sexual activity and not just sexual intercourse. So anything sexual in any way, shape or form in Canada requires consent under the law which is great for a lot of reasons, one of which is that it's not heteronormative, so it doesn't assume you're a straight guy having sex with a straight woman. It doesn't matter what gender you are or what sexual orientation you are. You all have the right to ask and give consent. And the third piece that's important to remember is that it's the sexual activity in question. So there's no such thing as sort of giving someone a blanket yes for any freaky thing you could ever think of, I say yes to. You have to ask for consent every step of the way. So I say this, for one, obviously there's folks here who are interested in law, so it's good you have the citation of where it's actually from. But also because when we talk about consent, there's this real sort of sense that if I did what the feminists tell me to do, I would never have a good time, right? It's like super restrictive. I can't even hold someone's hand without getting them to sign a contract or else like she's going to tell me I assaulted her. Like this is where people go in their minds, right? This is super chill. You can do this and have the best time, right? So this is what's really important for people to understand is the law recognizes that this is what consent is. It's not me and my five friends who made it up. This is the law. <laughs> so the exceptions are, one, where the complainant is incapable of consenting to the activity. So if I am passed out, if I am super, super drunk, if I am high as a kite, if I am medicated, if I am asleep, I am not capable to consent because I'm not with it. I don't know what's going on. Two, where the accused induces the complainant to engage in the activity by abusing a position of trust, power, or authority. So oftentimes we talk about that in the context of children and how children can't consent, but really it doesn't matter how old you are, if that person has authority over you, then you cannot consent. So if I am incarcerated and you are my CO, I cannot consent because there's a power dynamic. If you're my boss and you guarantee whether or not I have housing tomorrow, whether or not I have a job, I cannot consent. The law recognizes that you have too much power over me. Three, where the complainant expresses by words or conduct a lack of agreement to engage in the activity. Under the law in Canada, you have to prove that you got a yes. I don't have to prove that I said no. And that's not how people understand it, but that is literally how the law defines it. You have to be able to walk away from whatever you just did and unequivocally say, yes, I got consent from that person. So nothing 
does not mean yes, right? You have to get a yes from someone. And then lastly, where the complainant having consented to engage in sexual activity expresses by words or conduct, this is language that like, no one uses when they speak to people, but um, a lack of agreement to continue to engage in the activity. So I do a lot of work with high school students, and I can tell you that this is the one that I hear about the most, which is, well, I said yes to making out with him, so then I felt like I couldn't say no then because I'd already said yes to something, even though I realized I was no longer comfortable with what was going on. That's not the case. Under the law, I was okay with this, and all of a sudden I'm not okay anymore. You have the right to say no, and that person has to respect that no. Make sense? I don't talk this way. I don't know people who talk this way in like when they're actually chatting with people. So the way in which we define it is that one, it's voluntary. So once again, coercion is not consent. If you work with youth or you have kids or you have like kids in your life, have a conversation with them about co coercion because it's mind boggling to me how when I go and talk to high school students, it's like the biggest thing I hear afterwards is young women coming up to me talking about how they're feeling pressured, but then I eventually said yes, yeah, so do I have the right to be upset with him? Like it's so messed up. So really important to understand that consent has to be voluntary. Secondly, it has to be sober, and we'll talk about alcohol facilitated sexual assault shortly, but it has to be generally, it's not I had a drink, you had a drink, we were flirting a light and having a good time. It's that like the idea that someone has to be aware of what is going on. And that obviously differs by person to person and the law recognizes it as such, right? Because I could drink more than someone who's 5'2", for example, right? But you have to be able to unequivocally say that person knew what was going on enough for me to do what, what I was doing and for us to have a good time. Three, those of us who do this work, we refer to it as enthusiastic consent, which is that you once again walked away from something, you had a great time, you know that person had a great time, there's no sort of ifs or gray area of like, ooh, was that person really into it? Was I really into it? You can walk away being like, that was a good time, and that's it. And then lastly, it's never assumed. So just because someone hooked up with you once doesn't mean they have to hook up with you ever again, ever. Maybe you're a terrible lay or something and they never want to see you ever again, whatever. Never assume that that person, so someone who's hooked up with you or someone who has a reputation for putting out doesn't have the right to say no, because everybody does. So now we are going to hopefully watch a video. Ben, is Ben still here? Did Ben leave? Oh no, he left. Ben left. Oh God, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it together, guys. <laughs> so we're hopefully going to watch a video. We're gonna hope it works. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. 
or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. Which some people say is like a masturbation metaphor at the end. <laughs> Just saying. Some high school student was like, does that mean he's going to masturbate because he's making himself some tea? I was like, sure. Whatever you say, you adorable 15-year-old angsty child. Um, so, <laughs> so, it's on YouTube. There's also an uncensored version. Um, so just FYI, if you know folks who could use it, post it somewhere. Um, but I think it's a really good sort of thing, because like I said, whenever we talk about consent, people automatically think that if you did what the feminist told you to do, you would never have a good time, or that it's super, super complicated, and people just make mistakes because they can't understand it. I can tell you, because I work with children, when I work with children and I say, what is consent? An adorable child will put their hand up and say, when I give someone permission to do something. Like, we all fundamentally understand what consent is, but the second it involves hooking up with people, we oftentimes conveniently act like, oh, it's super complicated, I don't know what's going on, right? But if you ask someone, do you wanna come, do you wanna come to the movies with me on Friday? You know if that person's giving you a like, yeah, oh my God, I wanna go see that movie, versus like, uh, well, like, I'll get back to you, right? Like, you know instinctively, like, oh, that person maybe doesn't wanna go to the movies with me. But the second we put it in a sexual context, people act like, oh, I don't know what consent is, and it's like, we all do, right? So this is a good sort of reminder that it's a fundamental, basic thing that we all understand. Um, and then you get to watch a guy swear about tea. Um, so let's hope it's, there you go. So sex was also important, and I'm sure lots of folks here will know this because you are studying law, but one of the big sort of misconceptions, and we're seeing that right now a lot with this Young Gomeshi trial and the Bill Cosby stuff, is sexual assault is the blanket term for all forms of sexual assault in Canada. The term rape does not exist in the criminal code. Unfortunately, most of us grew up like, hands up if you watch, like, a, just a ton of, like, crime shows growing up on TV, American crime shows. Yeah, like, that's, like, everyone here, right? I had, like, one channel growing up, and all I played was Law & Order, like, six times, for, like, six hours straight. <laughs> Maybe CSI if you were feeling sassy. Um, so most of us grew up with an American understanding of the law, and one of the, the defaults, of, or one of the sort of the bad things about that is that when I talk to people about sexual assault, people think it's a minor form of, of assault, right? So they think, so the term sexual assault is used by the media, for example, and people think, well, it wasn't that bad because they didn't use the term rape. The term rape will not appear in the criminal code. It's not used by police officers. Sometimes it's used in the media, but not often, because under the law, it's all considered sexual assault. So we use the term sexual assault and sexual violence interchangeably, reason being that there are forms of assault that we define as sexual violence that aren't actually under the criminal code as such. For example, stalking. So stalking of women in particular is oftentimes by the hands of an ex-partner. So there's sort of the threat of rape hanging over their head. It's criminal, it's criminal harassment, but it doesn't fall under the umbrella of sexual assault. But it's, that's how it's experienced by victims. So that's why we use the term sexual violence. But basically, it's sort of important to remind folks that rape does not appear in the criminal code, first of all. So if you hear sexual assault and you minimize it in your own head, don't, because it could be rape in the way it's traditionally understood. But then secondly, the whole idea of creating a hierarchy of what's worse is really messed up, right? People have it in their mind of like, rape is terrible and everything else is not so bad. I would argue that it's all pretty terrible <laughs> and it's all connected, right? So if we live in a world in which it's totally fine that your girlfriend gets groped by a sketchy guy at the bar, then we probably live in a culture in which that person's gonna escalate that behavior at some point, which we know, right? So it's a weird hierarchy, it's not a hierarchy. Um, and the term rape, if someone uses it, when I'm working with women directly and they define their experience as rape, I'm not gonna correct them. But I think it's important for people to understand that just because you're not hearing the term rape doesn't mean it's not serious. So, statistically, and I think this is also, like I don't know if anyone else has been following the Gian Bill Cosby debacle, but um, people have thoughts and feelings about sexual assault in Canada right now. And one of the, the things that we're hearing a lot of is that it doesn't actually happen all that often. And that what we're hearing about right now is some sort of anomaly, but it's not. So stats on sexual violence are notoriously difficult to get, so it's always sort of a bit of an approximation, but sort of standardly what we understand in Canada is one in three Canadian women, one in six boys, and one in five trans folks will experience sexual violence in their lifetime. You will notice I say women and boys separately. So what we know is that if you're a man, you're born a man, you live your whole life as a man, you live to be a man over the age of 18 and you're never incarcerated, 
the chances of you being sexually assaulted are minimal, like barely on the radar. It's young boys who are overwhelmingly at risk of sexual violence. And when I'm working, <coughs> pardon me, when I'm working with men, it's overwhelmingly adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So when you're talking about children, young boys and young girls are at risk at almost the same amount. Interestingly enough, men hit puberty and they're therefore scary looking, and therefore people are afraid of them, whereas young women actually become more vulnerable once they hit puberty, and men, your chances go down. So, young women under 25 have the highest rates of sexual assault in Canada and criminal harassment, which is stalking. Also important to note is that less than 10% of sexual assaults are reported to police. Now typically, when I say that, <clears throat> there's like at least one smart ass in the room who says, well then how do you know? Right, some person who thinks that's their big like mic drop moment of like, if less than 10% are reported to police, then how do you know that? And I was like, because the cops say so, right? So the police themselves, when they compare the amount of people who go to the hospital, the amount of people who come see the Polly's and Julie's of the world to get mental health support, the amount of people who go that route versus the amount of people who walk through their doors, they will say 90% of people never come and see us. So the police themselves recognize that they are seeing a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people who've experienced sexual assault. And good police attachments are actively working on changing that, but there isn't a police attachment in the country that will tell you, oh yeah, everyone who's been raped comes to see us. They know that's not what's happening. And there's a million reasons for that, which is a whole other separate conversation, but what's important to remember is that in large part it's because 80 to 95% of people are assaulted by someone they know. So statistically in Canada, across the board, it's about 80, and on campuses it's generally at 95%. But that's not the way in which people understand it. It's certainly not what I experienced growing up watching just a ton of Law and Order, right? And even though it's 2016, we still have like a super, super cliched, archaic understanding of sexual assault, which is pretty young straight woman attacked by a probably mentally ill, definitely obviously scary looking man in public, physically assaulted as well as sexually assaulted. I fought back, I punched you in the face, I made a big scene, I had visible scars to say I was assaulted. That is rape. Everything else is like up to interpretation. So, if you're assaulted by your partner, by your uncle, by your boss, by the guy you party with, by your teammate, whatever, people oftentimes have to take, it takes some time to even process what happened to them as sexual assault, because in their mind, that's not what that is. Sexual assault is this like super narrow thing, and anything outside of that is like a bad afternoon, right? And then similarly, if the person who assaulted you is part of your family or your husband or whomever, then there's the realization of like someone I know and care about is gonna go to jail if I say something. So there's a lot of reasons why people don't report, but I bring this up to remind you that if you're hearing about sexual assault, it's probably because it was reported to police, and that means that 90% of what's happening in your community, in your family, in your campus, you're never gonna hear about. And that similarly, if someone tells you they were assaulted by someone, and you're like, but I know that person, and he's good people, then I would challenge you to sort of think about, that's the vast majority of people are assaulted by someone they know. Which means if you know victims, you might also know perpetrators, and sometimes that's the hardest part for people to wrap their head around. Also super, super important, it bums me out, and I have this conversation with Polly all the time, because I talk about sexual violence and because I hate rape, there's this idea that I hate men and I hate sex, which is so bizarre to me. <laughs> so this is me sort of taking two seconds to remind you <laughs> that I don't hate men, straight up, so that's my hot tip for you this morning, but also that one in three women being assaulted does not mean that one in three men is a perpetrator. And that the vast majority of perpetrators, 97% of people who are perpetrators of sexual violence are men, but that does not mean that 97% of men are perpetrators. Most perpetrators are men, most men are not perpetrators. We are talking about a tiny percentage of men who are repeat offenders, which is why the term serial rapist makes me rage with the heat of a thousand suns, because that's what most rapists are. Most perpetrators are repeat offenders. They get away with it, they realize there are zero consequences for the behavior, so they do it again and again and again. So, one in three women does not mean one in three men is a perpetrator. And that's why for me, conversation of bystander intervention is so important, because we hear about this stuff, we see it, we hear rumors about it, and what we do in that moment decides whether or not someone thinks they're gonna be believed if they report, and decides whether or not that guy gets the message that what he's doing is not okay. Does that make sense? I don't hate men, quote me. Tweet that, tell the world. <laughs> Also super important, just very quickly, this is like I said, we could talk about the law and why people don't report for like three straight hours, there's entire courses dedicated on that. 
But just to once again, particularly right now with what's going on with Xi'an and conversations about false reporting and the way in which people traditionally understand it, this was taken from the Toronto Star when the Xi'an story broke. So this is like less than two years old. Um, but StatsCan has just released new information and actually the results are even worse. So I just sort of plant that seed because once again, whenever, and police will tell you this, lawyers will tell you this, support workers will tell you this, when someone comes forward to say they've been sexually assaulted, they are doubted more than any other crime. And so if someone, and we know this, like people who've been assaulted know that nobody wants to hear what they have to say. So if someone tells you something, they literally have zero incentive to lie. Because this idea that I can just say, oh yeah, I was raped yesterday and that guy's gonna go to jail tomorrow, is just complete bullshit to be frank, right? So for example, around half a million people report to StatsCan that they were sexually assaulted. So once again, what incentive do I have to lie to Statistics Canada about having been assaulted? Like, what do I get from that? Nothing. So about half a million people, of those, only 15,200 actually <coughs> reported to police. I'm like really terrible at math, but that's like a poor percentage. Then of those, only 13,200 were reported as a crime. Then even of those who were reported as a crime, only 5,544 charges were laid. Out of those, only 2,824 were prosecuted and 1,519 were convicted. And then if you keep going down the sad chart of doom, you will see that even what you get if you are convicted, oftentimes your sentence is pretty minimal compared to what people think in their mind. Of like, you've been convicted of sexual assault, you're like on the sex offender registry and you're never gonna see the light of day. That's not how it works. So I'm just very quickly sort of going over this to sort of remind you once again that this idea that every single assault should be cast with a bit of doubt, um, just take a second to sort of think about where is that coming from? Because that's not what we're seeing statistically. And if you don't believe me, it's from the Toronto Star. So they're <laughs> legit. <laughs> so part of the reason why we don't do anything is because of this delicious phenomenon called the bystander effect. And it was first observed in the medical community where people would like legit have a seizure or overdose in like the middle of a concert and people would just kind of stand around and be like, oh, that's super awkward and just like walk away. <laughs> but it's super counterintuitive, right? Because you would think the presence of other people would shame you into doing something. Like you'd think, oh, I'm with other people. I'm going to look like a dick if I don't do something. But in fact, what ends up happening is generally one of two things. So the sense that I don't have to do something because someone else will. Or I look around and no one else bothered to like do anything, so I'm thinking like, why should I put myself out there? Now you are sitting here observing this as a bystander, which is super important, but it's also important to take a second and put yourself in the shoes of someone who's been victimized. So I, something happens to me, people hear about it, people see it, they don't do anything. So then why would I pick up the phone to call somebody who wasn't there and try to convince them that what happened to me wasn't okay? Because my own friends or the people who heard about it didn't have my back, right? And that similarly, if I did something and I look around and no one's stopping me, then I just got the message that like what I'm doing is totally fine and there's no need to do anything about it, right? Now this is for any kind of medical situation, any kind of emergency situation across the board. But we also have to be realistic that we live in a world in which people believe a lot of myths about sexual assault. So I'm not intervening when I see this person who's like, really, this guy won't leave this woman alone at the bar or at the party or whatever. I'm not doing anything because I'm like, oh, maybe someone else will or no one else is doing something, so I don't have to. But also because we subscribe to this idea that like only certain kinds of people get raped and so like they're not worthy of being helped or you made a poor decision. So like, how did you not think this was going to happen? Right. <laughs> then you also have that people don't even know what sexual assault looks like. Right. So it's this idea that I am like fighting some sketchy guy in an alley downtown, and if that's not what's happening, that I don't even register what's happening as sexual assault. So sort of the saddest, most infamous case of this was a case in Steubenville, Ohio, where this young woman was like completely blacked out drunk and people physically carried her from party to party. And she was sexually assaulted, people took pictures of it, the whole thing. And so when the police got involved, they went and took, found all the people in the pictures and were like, why did you not do anything? And they were like, oh, well, she wasn't fighting back, so I didn't think like, she was pissed off about it, right? Like these people didn't even realize that what they were witnessing was sexual assault. Because in their mind, it's like, well, she's not fighting them, so it's all good, right? Also important is oftentimes people know, like they see stuff, they register it as a shady situation, but they don't do anything because they're afraid it's gonna come back on them. So you see that a lot in terms of workplace sexual harassment, where it's like, if I say something, then this person's gonna come after me, or people are gonna make it so that I don't wanna work here anymore. But even socially, right? Like if you're the buzzkill of your friends, people don't want to party with you anymore, right? 
or all of a sudden you're the bad guy because you like blew the whistle on this whole situation. And then lastly, which is where I come in, which is the point where you hope that people see stuff and recognize that it's not okay, but they don't do anything because they just don't know what to do, which is why I think it's important to give people sort of practical tools. So bystander intervention sounds like, and I can tell you this because I literally teach this every single day, people think it's like two dudes shanking each other at the bar and I'm like asking you to like throw yourself in between them. And people are like, oh, if I do that, like I'll get, like people tell me that all the time, I will get murdered if I intervene. I was like, okay, that's like a bit extreme. Like if someone has a knife, I'm not telling you to put yourself in between. That's not what we're talking about. But people go to the most extreme example all the time to sort of get themselves off the hook. Instead, what we're saying is like, do you want to live in a world in which less than 10% of, of sexual assaults are reported to police? Do you want to live in a world with such a small conviction rate? I don't, right? But the only way we're gonna get there is that when people speak up, you believe them, and you make sure they get support, and then we can hold perpetrators accountable. But we can't even get there if we still have a space in which your own friends judge you for what happened to you, or don't have your back if they see stuff going on that's not okay. So what we do is, and we have a whole bunch of those that we'll have out there, so you can grab some if you want, posters and postcards. So what I do is I travel around and I have, depending on the context, conversations with folks, where we just ask them questions. Like, you see this shady thing go down, what are you gonna do? And it's actually the most effective way to get people to start thinking about it, because my thing is, I don't want you to tell me what you think I wanna hear, because that doesn't change shit, right? Instead, folks need to be realistic about what they would or wouldn't do in different situations. So for example, your wasted friend stickers out of the bar with some guy, do you stay and keep dancing? So two things, one, when we first launched the website, you had to vote on a scenario in order to get deeper so that we could see kind of get some stats on where people at and what people were doing or not doing. So for the two years that that was the case, about 65 to 75% of people said they would stay and keep dancing. Why do you think that is? Also, if you don't dance, like there's usually some person who's like, I don't even dance, I would never stay and keep dancing. Like, fine, well, do you stay and order another drink? Do you stay and like slay at karaoke for another song? Like whatever it is that you do when you go out. 65 to 75% of people respond to this to say they stay and keep doing what they're doing. Why do you think that is? I'm gonna grab a sip of my Starbucks and let you all ponder. Yeah, nice and loud so everyone can hear you. Yeah. Uh, like maybe it's their two friends that they already participate in like a lot of sexual activities, so they don't care for their friend. Just go do the thing. Yeah. They don't want their good. Yeah. I don't want to be a third wheel, yeah. And also, like, my friend goes to the bar and hooks up with people, that's their thing, so, like, yeah. let them do their thing. Yeah, here? Yeah, like, maybe they were planning on it, like, oh, we're gonna go meet some hot guys and just party all night and then, like, go to their place or something. So maybe it was, like, they were planning on it, so now seeing her go out the door, like, you know, she she got what she wanted kind of thing. Okay. So that's what she was planning on doing. Yeah. So just having your other hand up, yeah. Uh, they don't want to get the friend mad at them, so if yeah, so um, generally people dance around it, so I'll just say it for you, right? Nobody wants to be a cock block, right? Or a twat swat, whatever you're into, right? So the idea, right, that's what people are thinking, right? Is that my friend is hooking up with somebody, so who am I to tell them they can't do that? Right? Who am I to stop my friend from having a hookup? Or, like you said, maybe that was our whole plan, was we're gonna go to the pub on Friday, and we're gonna meet some cute folk, and we're gonna have ourselves a good time, right? Now, we purposely keep it super vague, because oftentimes, we, there's a lot of details that we don't know ahead of time, right? So there's like 800 million asterisks that you could include, which is like, maybe they went ahead of time and said that this was a plan, or maybe you whatever, right? But really, it's purposely made as like, your friend who you know, is leaving with someone that you don't know, what do you do in that moment, right? And so people have all this stuff going through their head. And the other thing too we have to be mindful of is that like you're also probably pretty hammered also. So your capacity to like assess a situation as being shady might be different on Friday night than it is on Tuesday afternoon, right? So that's, we're aware of that and we get that. But the reason why we talk about this is for a few reasons. So half of sexual assaults in Canada involve booze, half which is a huge percentage, right? Hands up if you, before you went to college, before you became of age slash actually started drinking, 
Uh, whatever age that was. I'm from the boonies, I don't judge. Um, off the record, no one will tweet this, you're fine. How many people, <laughs> she's like, do not look at the police officer when you put your head up. How many people got a lecture, women in particular, but anyone, how many people got a lecture about what to do with your drink when you went out to drink? Okay, so just sort of what are some of the things you were told about partying safely with your booze as a kid or whatever? What's that? Don't put your drink down. Don't put your drink down, okay. Don't take drinks from other people. Don't take drinks from other people, yeah. Don't take your eyes off your drink. Don't take your eyes off your drink, yeah. If you put it down, don't get another. Yes. At the back? <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Like cover the opening of your drink? Yes. So, cover your drink with your nasty hand that's been like all over the bar and doing whatever shady things you're doing at the bar. Keep your hand on your drink, make creepy eye contact with the person who's pouring it and make sure it comes directly from something that hasn't been opened before, right? Not just like, oh, here's like a Red Bull I found, right? It's like, I have to like, you poured it, right? And I put it down, and if I put it down and I look away, it's like dead to me now, right? <laughs> like that was like $14 that I'm never gonna see ever again. And then if I have to pee and I have my drink, what do I do? Take it into the nasty ass bar bathroom with you or abandon your $14 drink and just like go and get another one, right? Now, I am not minimizing drug facilitated sexual assault. Drug facilitated sexual assault happens. And in fact, it happens in places where people don't suspect. Oftentimes in places where it's kind of like a cheers vibe of like, oh, everyone knows everyone. So people don't do the things that they're told to do, right? There are multiple people who were roofied, as it's called, at Folk Fest. Like it's city folk, right? So people think it's like when you go to a rave or like those kinds of clubs, it's pubs and city folk. <laughs> it happens. So I am not minimizing that in any way, shape or form. But what's important to understand is that the number one date rape drug is actually booze itself, right? So it's not you co like cover your drink, take your nasty drink into the nasty bathroom, like do what you gotta do, right? But the lecture we need to give people is about booze itself, right? So we live in a culture in which like you go to the bar and someone buys you a drink because it's like $45 or whatever it is. You're like a huge bitch if you say no, right? And also what's important to understand is people talk about, oh, well she went, like she drank too much and she should have known better, right? But how do you know where your limit is until you've crossed it? Straight up, right? So if you're talking about 15 year olds, for example, right, who are super drunk, like this girl in Steubenville, Ohio, and the message was like, oh, well, she had too much to drink. Yeah, but like how many people found out where their line was by crossing it? And the consequence for drinking too much should be a hangover and like crying about how your mom never loved you or whatever it is that you do when you drink too much and not sexual assault. Like someone who's had too much to drink, it's not your job to now punish that person with sexual assault. Like it's so bizarre that that's where we go in our minds. But it doesn't actually make any sense, right? So booze is the problem. Not inherently like don't drink, right? And this is what I think is so offensive to me is whenever we hear about, so for example, the red zone is the first six to eight weeks of school on any campus at any time in Canada has some of the highest rates of sexual assault anywhere in the country at any point. And it's oftentimes because people are out on their own for the first time, they're partying hard, they're living large, as you should, that's the whole point, right? But what ends up happening is that we then have these like editorials where we talk about the problem is binge drinking on campus, right? Binge drinking on campus is a problem. Talk to Polly about it. She'll hook you up, right? But the, the answer to this is not telling women not to drink and not telling people not to drink. People should drink. People go and do your thing. You're a grown ass person. I'm not here to stop you. What I'm here to talk about is the fact that we culturally decide that people who've had too much to drink made bad choices and therefore are not deserving of support and not deserving of us intervening. So, What's also super important to understand is we have this idea that alcohol facilitated sexual assault, which is what we call this scenario, is like a miscommunication. Like I was good, you were good, then the next morning she said I assaulted her and like that's bullshit, she was into it the whole time. That's not what we're talking about, because that doesn't happen. What we're talking about is, on a brand new study that was just done, I guess two years ago now, in Toronto, so it's a Canadian study that was just done, where folks went to bars and waited until the lights came on. Anyone here want to own being at a bar when the lights come on and they play like, was it closing time? And everyone's like real tragic. And anyway, hand up if you've been at the bar when the lights come on. Uh, so many people here are so full of shit. I love it. Okay, so you're at the bar, the 
the lights come on, it's like sad, and everyone looks really terrible, and you're like, what am I doing? I'm making poor life choices, right? So, you're at the bar, it's two or whatever it is, and, and two, let's say. The lights come on, it's time to go. What they observed, right, is people purposely targeting women who had been isolated from their friends, women who were by themselves, women who couldn't find their friends, women who'd had too much to drink, women who were leaning on tables, couldn't find their shoes, couldn't find their purse, couldn't find their friend, and that person recognizes that person is vulnerable and takes advantage of that situation. That's what we're talking about. But I can't talk about this without people saying, well, now you're telling me I can't have two shots and hook up with some hot chick at the bar. That's not what I'm saying. What we're talking about is purposeful targeting of people that you know darn well have had way too much to drink and need to go home. And we had a whole rash of stuff happening downtown that we kept hearing about in the market where all of a sudden these women who are like super hammered are like stumbling towards cabs and dudes that no one has seen all night are like, oh, it's cool, I'm gonna take her home. And then you're like, what just happened to that person, right? That's what we're talking about, okay? So I wanna be very, very clear that this is what we're talking about. We're talking about people that we all know, take, it, take sex out of the equation, people that were like, that girl needs to go home. She's crying, she's gonna puke, it's not a good scene, right? But that we have a culture in which we enable people to be like, Oh, no, well, she made bad choices, so like obviously some riffraff from the bar was going to take her home, right? So, how we solve this problem, the easiest thing to do, so maybe you have the question of like, well, maybe she knows that guy and like that was her plan to hook up with him, right? Or maybe they knew each other, but you didn't know they knew each other, and you're like, oh, well, if I say something, like, do I look like a dick? Like, I'm not trying to crush them having a good time or whatever, right? Then you just ask them. Like, literally the easiest thing to do is to just check in on people. And I can tell you in the context of all of the work I do, whether you're talking about people in the workplace, whether you're talking about people being street harassed, like they're waiting for the bus and some creepy guy won't leave them alone, like the easiest thing to do in any situation is just go up to someone and say, are you good? And then if your friend is like, oh my God, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Like, I'm gonna go home with him, it's all good. I'll text you tomorrow. Then you're like, okay, cool. You didn't make it awkward. You didn't like kill a buzz. You literally just checked in on your friend to make sure they're okay. But if when you ask the question, your friend can't answer you because they're so hammered, they can't form a sentence, then that's your cue that that person needs to go home, right? And if you go there and your friend makes eye contact with you, now some of the women here might know what I'm talking about when you're at the bar, and you make eye contact with your friend and you're just like, get me out of here, this dude is creepy. Yes, I see people nodding, you know what I'm talking about, right? Or you're dancing on the dance floor and then someone's like, block, block him, and then you just like dance to block the creepy person. Yes, people, heads up if you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, look around you, people know exactly what I'm talking about. That is bystander intervention, first of all, so you're a hero when you dance block for your friend, right? But that's literally all we're talking about. That's it. Like you check in on your friend. You make eye contact with your friend. Your friend might have been like, okay, whatever, I'll go home with you because maybe I said no to you for like three straight hours and you wouldn't take no for an answer and now I'm afraid and I'm just going with you. So when you check in on your friend and you say, are you good? And she gives you the like, no, then you're like, okay, let's get out of here. But if everything is fine, then everything is fine. And you didn't make it weird because you just asked if they were okay, right? Now, if your friend, you think your friend has had way too much to drink and you think your friend needs to go home and your friend doesn't want to go home, then there's nothing you can do. Right? You can't kidnap people, as my police officer friend here will attest to, do not kidnap your friend. That's not helpful either, right? But at least you did what you could to make sure that your friend knew that someone had their back, and then you say, text me when you get there, or I'm gonna call you in an hour, and if you don't pick up, I'm gonna come find you, like whatever it is you wanna do, right? But by simply texting or going up to your friend and saying, are you good? That gives you an opportunity to assess the situation. You can also create some sort of distraction, right? So if your friend's super hammered and you're like, okay, well, we're just gonna say we have to get out of here and like, oh, Julie's getting sick in the bathroom, like we gotta go, like you know how she is, whatever. Like throw me out of the bus if you need to, it's fine, right? We, so we have to get her out of here, right? But if you, because you are petite, right? So I'm like a tall person who does this for a living, so I will sass a dude at the bar that I think is being creepy and I'm not afraid to, right? But if I was like five foot four, Right, and dude is huge, and I'm just like, I'm gonna take my friend home. Maybe you're a little afraid to do that, right? So roll deep and get some friends to come with you, right? Get your other friends, tell the bouncer, and say like, my friend's in trouble, she can't leave with this guy, and I, like, we gotta get him out of here, right? 
But what is important to understand is oftentimes people will get here and they're like, okay, cool, I get it. Then they put themselves in that situation and they're like, what if I say my friend needs to get out of here and dude tries to fight me, right? That is exactly why you need to intervene. Because if I'm a good dude, which the vast majority of them are, and I'm like taking this person home and then her roommate is like, oh my God, we got it. Like she, we just gotta go home. Like it's not a good scene, we gotta go home. And I care about this person and I'm not a dirtbag, then I would say, oh, you live with this person. You saying she's not okay. Here's my number, I'll text her tomorrow. Why would I get my back up if you're telling me that you're looking after your friend who clearly needs to go home and is not in a good place and that if you take this person home, it's not gonna end well for you. If you're good people, which the vast majority of them are, they'll be like, oh, okay, I'm bummed out about it, but here's my number, bye, right? If you are afraid that person is going to fight you, that is exactly why you need to intervene and roll deep if need be, right? Does that make sense? But the easiest thing to understand, like the only thing, if you take nothing away, is that checking in with people is so underestimated as an important way to intervene, but it's the best and easiest thing you can do because it gives you an assessment as to what's going on. Your friend can't answer you, your friend looks terrified, then you get them out of there. Your friend's like, no, 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 it's cool, it's cool, like, I'm, I'm on this, then high five, have yourself a great afternoon or whatever it is you're doing. Does that make sense? So, this is just sort of a reminder that bison intervention is not two dudes shanking each other on the 95, please put yourself in between and be a hero. If that's the case, be, an, be a bystander and just tell the bus driver, <laughs> don't put yourself in between, right? But we, we really go to the extreme and we don't need to. So bystander intervention is calling out the behavior, right? So naming the situation for what it is, right? Which is not just like, oh, my friend gets drunk on Fridays and makes bad choices. Like she's being targeted by someone. Everybody knows she's had too much to drink. We need to intervene. Two, even if you think people shouldn't drink too much, even if you think your friend's a bit of a slut and puts herself in bad situations, it's not your place to judge. It's your place to make sure that person gets supported, whatever that looks like. Mental health support, just having someone to cry to for five minutes, like whatever it is that they need. And then three, calling out the behavior is super, super important in terms of speaking out and naming it for what it is, right? So the assumption, like it's so interesting to me that we just assume that bars and creepy guys are like a beautiful combination that we can never do anything about. I was like, no, creepy dudes at bars are enabled by us just not doing anything about it, right? And the idea that like people who drink too much are automatically gonna get assaulted and this weird sort of leap in logic, I'm like, no, someone made a choice that we can change. Do you have a question in the back? Or your hand up? I like number three saying support the person being targeted. Um, I think what I find is sometimes um, in situations where there's a, a person who's planning on sexually assaulting another person, <coughs> Uh, the person pretends like they're like so they're like helping them, and then the person, the bystander, will go in and ask the person that's planning on assaulting the other person, "Oh, is is, is she okay?" And then she, they ask them, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm taking care of her. Like she'll be fine." And then the girl is, or the person is just like, you know, you know what I mean, or like just half passed out. But I find the bystander asks the wrong person. Totally. It happens a lot. I've yeah, awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. So in Ottawa right now, there's this amazing thing called Project Soundcheck where they're trying to train all the folks, volunteers at music festivals in the city to intervene properly. And part of it is exactly that. You see this girl who's like kind of sloppy, right? And you go up to them and say like, do you know this guy? Yeah. And oftentimes the answer will be no. And then you're like, okay, but he's a hero now. Like, no, I'll make sure that you, where are your friends? And then it's like, oh, I can't find my friends. Okay, well, let's help you find your friends or whatever, right? Yeah. But this idea, I think more than anything, is people are, so, the things that people will do to avoid an awkward situation is fascinating to me. Like people are like, what if it's awkward? I was like, do you know how many awkward things happen in a day, like all day, every day? <laughs> like, but people will do anything to avoid the potential of an awkward situation. It's so fascinating to me. But yeah, ask the person who's been targeted. And if they can't answer you, that's your answer, right? Any other questions, thoughts and feelings? How are we doing? Yeah, we're good. So this is our info for the folks who are tweeting or doing whatever it is that they're doing. Um, if you go to our website, draw line.ca, you can download all of the graphics for the stuff we have. We also have some at the table at the back. Um, I'm gonna give folks, Polly, can you help me distribute? Mm -hmm. So if you can take, whoop, two seconds to fill this out, it will help us and help, help me help you. And I will explain to you, there's two sides and there's pens here too. 
There are two sides, the front and the back. At the very least, if you can fill out the front, you don't have to put your name, whatever info you can, that'd be great. I will be here until one, so folks still want to chat but didn't want to do so in front of everyone, just come and see me.